to introduce our speaker. Scripture tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 19, verse 1. Well, Dr. Georgia Dunstan thinks that the human genome declares the glory of God. Georgia earned a PhD in human genetics at the University of Michigan. Hello, Bobby Tull. <laughs> she went on to work in genetics with a special emphasis on diseases at Howard University, the National Cancer Institute, and the National Institutes of Health, where she also worked with Francis Collins who, as director of the National Institutes, oversaw the sequencing of the human genome. She is a professor of human immunogenetics at Howard University, now retired professor, and the founding director of the National Human Genome Center there at Howard. She is a featured speaker in the American Association for the Advancement of Science video series, Science the Wide Angle. And you should hear her talk about wonder. She brings not only a scientist's precision, but a preacher's flair for the message that the human genome declares the glory of God. She speaks with such passion and clarity on this topic that I thought you should, one, hear the message, and two, meet the person, because both of them are unforgettable. And let that passion and clarity inform your approach to the relationship between faith and science. I will add these two personal notes. When I was thinking about who to invite to be part of this day, and the world was our oyster at this point because of the grant money, I was really inclined to invite Georgia. But I don't have much opportunity to run across her because She's in Washington, D.C., and I'm in St. Louis. But I was headed to a meeting of scientists in Washington, D.C., and I prayed, Lord, I would really like to invite Georgia, but I don't know if I'll ever see her. If it's on your heart, too, then please provide an opportunity for me to run into her and in a place and in a time where we can talk. So I walked into an enormous lecture hall at the AAAS annual meeting, and there was Georgia Dunstan, sitting by herself. And I figured that was the anointed moment. And so there she was, and so here she is. And if a friendship is developing between Georgia Dunstan and myself, and I think it is, it's because it's so easy to share moments of personal faith with her, which is an outstanding thing. Please welcome Dr. Georgia Dunstan. Thank you so much Ed, for that very warm introduction. And I want to thank each of you for being here. There really is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Uh, I have felt it from the moment I walked through the doors and certainly with all the activities and encounters I've had at the mills and just passing on the hall. I really appreciate that. So let me begin by thanking Dr. Ed Hogan for this truly opportuni true opportunity to speak to you and for planning this Science Enhances Faith Symposium. It speaks to the two main paths of my life. First, as an academician, where I served for 45 years. And secondly, as a Christian, as a believer in Christ, that I have been for 65 of my 75 years. This symposium is unique for me in being able to bring the two paths of my passion. <laughs> as an academician and as a believer in Christ together. And I must confess, I have taught and been a lecturer for nearly, as I say, 45 years, but I 
was feeling a little nervous in terms of speaking to you because quite honestly, I usually speak on one or the other, but to try to have an opportunity to bring them together was special and the talk was put together just for this audience and for this time. So uh, here it is. I will tell you that I, um, I was a Sunday school teacher long before I became a college professor. And as a Sunday school teacher, I fell in love with the truths of scripture and the character of Jesus Christ. As a college professor, I fell in love with the facts of science and the truths that it desires to bring forth. But my position is truth is a person, the way, the truth, and the life. And because the goal of science is to really uh, reveal, to see the truth, it brings my, 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 my life desires together. So for this talk, um, I put together a series of slides that I have timed, but I am guilty. So I need my host and dear friend here to give me a five minute warning. Maybe for me, make it a seven minute warning, please. <laughs> Seven minute warning, I'm holding him to that so that I can, wherever I am, make sure I go through because I really would like you to see the slides that I worked so hard on for you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. So, we are in the third millennium. I like to characterize the third millennium as the millennia of the mind. We are now at a place where we will be studying the nuances and studying the details, the operation of the mind with the precision that the previous uh, millennia have focused on the body. Certainly in science, the mind is front and center. So I love it when I think about we have the mind of Christ. And how can science now be used to enhance our faith. The millennia of the mind, the first hundred years, we're in the century of consciousness. That's on the front line. What is consciousness? How is it structured? How does it work? And think about the kind of precision science has brought to the study of the bo body. We now will bring tools and technologies of science to understand consciousness. We have several decades. The first decade, 2010, was when the human genome sequence was, uh, uh, was completed. I like to call that 2010 then the decade of discovery. We were finding genes every week with the sequence there. On the front page of every journal, we found the gene for cancer, the gene for hypertension, the gene for asthma. We were finding a gene a week, if you will, because of this resource. But we're now com um, converging next year. We begin 2020. Now, in the interim from 2010 to 2020, we, I like to think we are now in this millennia, in this century, in this decade of destiny. It's all about who we are. It's about what we are. And destiny brings us to each day being a day of decision about identity. The genome is about our inheritance and it's about our identity. I'd like to put this phrase in that the question that Jesus placed to his followers. What about you, Jesus asked? Who do you say I am? What do you put behind that statement? Because how we define ourselves is fundamental and key 
to how we live our life. It's fundamental to the resources that we have. And now, I'd like to give a truth statement that undergirds the science that we are focusing on, the science of identity. I love the scripture from Hebrews here, where we see here, the Hebrews, I will put, this is the Father say, I will put my laws in their mind. <laughs> I will write them on their hearts. The genome literally writes the word on every molecule that's expressed in our body. The genome codes for those molecules that I want to equate with words. And my statement is, not only has he put his law, his word in our mind, written it on our heart, but today he is making us to know he has encoded it in our genome, our very inheritance. So I look at the genome as the sacred code of life, for indeed, who can argue as to who is the maker of the genome? Certainly man cannot take credit for having put the genome together. So it is sacred and it's about life, as I will uh, say over and over throughout the talk. So we are learning the sacred code of life, of light, and it is also the word that brings liberation. Liberation from what? The absence of truth, which is ignorance. You may say that the life we live is a function of the truth we have. So in the beginning, as Dr. Hogan stated, I love to begin with this. In the beginning was the word. The word was before the Big Bang. The word gave rise to everything. In the beginning was the word. I liked the word is what God says. And that's the reality and that's the truth. The word was made flesh. Look at this genome. This genome codes for proteins. We consider proteins flesh. And we're going to look at how this genome is analogous. It gives us, for me, it's like giving us a parable that we can use something that our minds can, our intellect can hold on to, to teach the truths that are, are being stated. The sequencing of the human genome has come. This is my contention, that we may have life and have it in its fullness, as stated in John 10.10. 10. It has come and been sequenced in time that we can know the life that is spoken of in John 10.10. 10. The human genome unfolds for us the path of self-discovery, who we are, and the fulfilled life that's spoken of in uh, John 10.10. 10. So the overview here, let's look at that which came before everything. The genome declares the glory of God the Father and personalized in human identity. And my truth for that is, and God said, let us make man in our image and let them have dominion. That's the w truth, the word foundation. The genome encodes the journey of life, this fulfilled life, this abundant life in time through humankind, and it's being studied now in the context of what we call human evolution. So the genome has come at this time to speak to two main subjects of scientific investigation, creation and human evolution. The genome speaks about creation and human evolution. We're made in the image of God, and human evolution deals with the manifestation over time in humans. The science of the human genome today then becomes what we call 
evidence-based. In medicine, everything is evidence-based. And we're living in a time that we call big data science. Everything is big data, big data. So the genome, just the methodology for sequencing the genome and all the knowledge that's encoded in sequencing the genome truly met the criteria of big data. So there's even a phrase that NIH coined for a whole area of investigation on what they call BD2K, which is moving from data to knowledge. But I think it's incomplete. I'm going to add for you from data to knowledge for wisdom. Knowledge puffs up, and it doesn't, you don't have to go further than science to appreciate how knowledge puffs up. But we need to then apply the knowledge for wisdom because the goal is how do we solve the big problems of our day? And the solutions to the problems require wisdom. So we're at a time where mainstream is focused on knowledge and who owns the knowledge and intellectual property. I think God sitting back looking at where we are in time said, this is my time to draw my line in the sand. When they start wanting to take credit for my knowledge, they're going to even patent it as intellectual property. They got it from me. <laughs> I mean, and you see it epitomized. This is at the end, but you see it epitomized in the big arena now of AI, artificial intelligence and robotics. That's front line. Even Trump in his State of the Union this year say we have to move forward with AI and is now setting up national AI institutes so that the U.S. will maintain its global presence in AI because AI is changing society, changing the economy, changing jobs. It's a big arena. Now, artificial intelligence is the best that we can come up with studying the model of what I like to call authentic intelligence, the real AI. So I present the genome, and my heart's desire, again, this is fast forward to the end, my desire for now is to really work with groups of comparable interests to set up faith-based genomic research institutes of AI, authentic intelligence, that will be the model for the best that we can come up with, with artificial intelligence. So stay tuned on that, okay? And uh, so I do this because I know when I start talking and I remember, oh, I wanted to say that, and I start running late. So I said, okay, I'm gonna put my take home point up front. <laughs> and then I'm gonna start at the end and work backwards and hopefully I'll cover everything to catch up with where we are now. But the take home point is that the human genome is the quintessential gift of life. The gift of life through science for the third millennial. I like to call it this third millennial, us, you particularly, and those that you will be influencing as you go forward. This is what I like to refer to as the glorious global genome generation, the G3. All right. Here's the prologue. The human genome forces us, think about this, the human genome forces us to think about, and I put that in quote, think about how we define ourselves and how who we say we are governs our behavior, which is related to the health of our body, the integrity of our communities, and the stability of our world. The health of our body, that's where the mainstream of 
health-related interest in the genome. How do we find genes that cause disease? How do we find and then how do we fix them and hopefully correct diseases? We forgot one thing in our big medical model, if you will. While we find genes that statistically we can relate to the uh, incidence of disease, Many of the medical models, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll address a little of this in the work our, our group is doing, many of the medical models don't factor in the role of the environment and how the environment is a determiner of not only what genes are expressed, but when they are expressed, where they are expressed, how much is expressed, and that's what's re reflected in the uh, outcome, the phenotype that we see, whether it's disease or what have you. That's key. That's key because the environment is not just our physical environment or our chemical environment, but more importantly, it is our psychological environment. And as scriptures say, say, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We cannot afford to not conclude in our model of life how not only how we think as a biological process but also what we think and now we have tools and technologies where we can image the brain and begin to actually track what centers of the brain is activated that correlate with certain ways we think and what we think, and what part of the brain, what cells and tissues and organs that controls, and how we can then relate that to disease expression. But it is not coincident that this is an era, the third millennia also has brought us the brain initiative, which I'll point out, where the goal is to map every neuron and understand really the biology of thinking. So we have to understand and we can use science not only to study how thinking is manifested in the brain with the, with the brain being the organ of expression, but we will now have the basis for looking at the content or the quality of our thinking. We get to choose what we think. And I love the fact that we can do really first-rate trials, I like to call them true clinical trials, to actually show the effect of thinking truth versus the lie. Because this genome was designed to manifest the truth as we are made to manifest the word of God. We already designed, we don't have to teach it just like we don't have to teach the stomach how to digest food. We don't have to teach the heart how to beat. We don't have to teach the eye how to see or the ear how to hear. We do not have to teach our genome how to believe the truth. And if thou canst believe all things, and science deals with the measurement of things are possible. We can choose through discipline our thinking what kind of life we want to live is already our inheritance and this is phenomenal to me I put this slide in and this is a, although we are an academic group I figured I needed to give you at least one data slide but <laughs> I'm not I'm, I'm giving statements that I, but I put this in just to show you this is a pie chart of the whole genome, our total inheritance, that we have three billion nucleotide parts that make up the human genome. And for those that may not have gotten to it in your biology yet, the genome itself is the complete set of instructions that each of us inherits from each of our parents for how to make and operate the human body. All of that information is in the genome. Now, this is a bar chart of the, and the characteristic of the genome is patterns of sequence, the nucleotide variation. 
that information, words are structured, if you were, it's a language, it's a message. Words are structured in patterns of sequence variation. The amount of our total inheritance that is required to make all the protein parts of the body. And we equate the protein with the flesh, or let's say the visible. Visible in terms of what we uh, see and measure in science, okay? Although that needs to be taken, uh, that can be qualified in terms of what we can see and measure, depends on what you're using to look with, okay? But suffice it to say, this slide shows that this little red sliver, 1.5% of our total inheritance is what's needed to make the, the proteins. We actually call these sections exons. This is the part of our genome that makes protein. Less than 2% of our total inheritance. Begging the question, well, what about the rest of the genome? By the way, when the Genome Project was started in 1990 and planned, <clears throat> big argument between the thought leaders and the planners. Do we sequence the whole genome or do we just sequence exons or the parts that make the body? There were those who say, we don't need to sequence the whole thing because the, the part outside of what makes the body is irrelevant. It even called, and you can find it in the literature, junk DNA. The thinking was that any part that was not involved in this part we're interested in, this physical body, and how, was not important enough to pay for. It was, it was a luxury. Fortunately, those who said, but no, we need to sequence the whole thing, won the day, and we pay billions of dollars as a society for this whole genome to be sequenced. And lo and behold, most of the sequence that's not in what makes the parts of the body or non-coding sequence deals with regulation and control. I like to see. It takes more wisdom to determine um, what gets seen than actually making that which is seen. Control and regulation. Most of the non-coding sequence deal with regulatory systems that are part of our inheritance that determine what we see. And what we see influences our interpretation of life. Just keep that in mind. And so I don't know if it shows here, but I, this, this, uh, this next slide I put in because I found this quote from a Roman Catholic priest. And I say, it wasn't about the genome, but it fit with my story, okay? <laughs> so I gave him a sequence slide. And this is Pierre. Okay, thank you, because they had accents, and I wasn't sure about the accent on that. But his word was, we must not only give what we have, we must also give what we are. I think that's appropriate for the genome sequence is what we have, but what it says about who we are has to be as much a part of what we give. I won't read the longer statement for time, but this was a statement that the president of our university, when I was instrumental in setting up the National Human Genome Center at Howard, the, um, and the dedication was in the chapel, okay? And the president of our university made this statement, which I loved, and I included it with foundation. Uh, I said I wouldn't read it, so I won't. <laughs> but uh, I, it, it's relevant. So we're talking now about this glorious global genome generation. We have a great commission, church, okay? We have a great commission, because for unto us, this third millennial glorious global genome generation is given the complete sequence of the human genome. Unto us the knowledge of life encoded in the whole human genome is revealed. And the science, technology, 
engineering, and mathematics, our popular scientific term, STEM. The STEM of life is encoded, as encoded in the genome, is expressed personally in each one of us at defining human identity. So as we ask the question, what is man? Who am I? Why am I? What am I? The question of identity. Look for the answer given in the word as to who we are. It's also expressed in this beautiful diversity that we see among us globally. Diversity is the hallmark of divinity. God makes everything unique, each one of us unique, billions of people. And each of us is unique and meet the requirements of physics because while we might have the identical sequence as we do in identical twins, but two things cannot occupy the same place at the same time. So the environment in which that thing is context will necessarily add uniqueness to how we perceive and how we live our life. So please know we are each unique. And this genome is a living information and communication system. This genome was communicating with us way before we got wireless communication. We had prayer. We had prayer. We've been communicating through the genome way before this current scientific age of communication. But everything we're learning through science about the science of information itself is reflected in the organization structure of the genome because it is authentic intelligence. It's knowledge. It's revelation knowledge, I like to say. So that with completing the human genome comes a new knowledge system for biology, biomedical, and the life science. It is knowledge that is as old as the origin of humanity and yet as new as the most recent scientific discovery. I call it time, timeless knowledge whose time has come. The genome is about life. Its information is structured in the pattern of variation, sequence variation. It's about biology, the science of life and living systems. And it's about identity, who we are. I got these quotes from three of our, uh, our, my key collaborators, and I like to put this in because the, the genome is a dynamic information and communication system that encodes both systematic and creative aspects of our being. Systematic and the creative aspects. My colleague, who is a theoretical physicist, I thought, and Dr. Barr was speaking last evening. Uh, my colleague, who is, an, who is a theoretical physicist, gave me this statement. He said to me that I find that the science of genomics is particularly provocative because it allows for that part that in science that admits that there's something, some things that are unknowable. Many scientists really think with enough money and time, we can know it all. Those that don't think that we already know it all. But his statement, it turns out that the human genome is an interface between the known, the knowable, and unknowable aspects of the science of life. I like that. Science, it's a, uh, it's a science, but it recognizes that there are some aspects of life that are unknowable by science. And then my colleague who is leading our initiative with quantum, with quantum biology likes, made this statement, so I included his statement, quantum biology has driven scientists to re-examine long-held assumptions of origins, 
purpose and identity and this whole area of the quantum realm and being able to begin to drill down through physical reality to the subatomic particles and particularly in this nanotechnology looking at the electron and looking through the eyes of an electron, what an electron sees in terms of what electrons are next to it and how that relates to electron energy shifts as they move from shelf to shelf. But all of science ultimately is framed by truth. In science, we, the goal is prediction. We want to know how to predict what will be. Certainly in genetics, it's clear that we study because we want to know what's going to happen. So supposedly we can prepare for it and make changes if necessary. But truth is the ultimate theoretical construct for all science. Now, the big questions that we face today what is the link between our genome, our genotype, behavior, ancestry, and destiny? We study ancestry, but most of the genome is about our destiny. What has been put into this that's yet to be experienced. And we're beginning to scratch some of the surface with the powers of the mind as we move into the millennia of the mind. This whole reality that we are designed to create uh, through our thinking with the charge in scripture to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we have to do this according to scripture to know the perfect, the good will of God for us. If you want the creator and maker of the genome to inform us about <laughs> who we are, we get our foundation in scripture and we need to uh, uh, know the place of truth in our operation. How does our genome interact with our environment, that environment physical, biological, psychological, socioeconomic, community, and culture to produce behavior? What are the methods that are available to investigate these questions? How can we use good science? And good science is that which can be tested. Otherwise, it's just speculation. Good questions, science, we have methods then to test whether or not our thinking is indeed consistent with truth if it's predictable. Because if it's based on truth, you can predict, and that's the goal. What are the societal we must look at in this age of artificial intelligence and robotics and replacement of jobs and changing economies, all the issues that are coming at this time? What are the societal, the ethical, the social implications of discovering the operation of the genome? Who's tending? to educating about the impact that this knowledge will have on our sense of identity, our purpose in life, our being. So this slide shows that the end product of the genome was to sequence the genome because it's all about life. And I like to put it in this kind, in the inner circle is the molecular level that science has focused on, the genome in the nucleus of the cell. But genome, um, in cells, equip cells to work together. Different cells work together, just as was stated in this slide from the Department of Energy with the sequencing, the finished sequence moves us from DNA to life. And you see over in the right hand corner, communities of cells. So the molecular pathways tell us how the cells work. Different cells work together to then look at this hierarchy of biology. Different cells work together to give us tissues. Different tissues work together to give us organs. Different organs work together to give us different systems. So we have the skeletal system. We have the reticular endothelial we ha system. We have the muscular system working together. The systems work together to give us a whole individual. 
But the order of life in biology doesn't stop at the boundary of the skin because we are not random. We are put together in biological units of families. And every unit has its inherited function. There are traits, there are gifts, I like to say, that's put in each one of us that we can trace and we can track. And those gifts will be in the family unit. And we can use the science of genomics or genetics to track gifts in families. We can track gifts that will have a higher frequency in each larger group in the population. And together, all the population, the global population, has a gift for humanity as a purpose. And I maintain that God has created from the microcosm of the molecular, and now physics takes us to the submolecular, the subatomic, the atomic, the subatomic, down to waves, and then look at the vibration or the pattern off of waves. It's all connected. The point is, humanity is made and has an inheritance to manifest the glory of God, which is the largest circle. The outside can be the cosmos in terms of the boundaries beyond, uh, or we can go drill down into the subconscious if you're drilling down through material reality. And in wrapping up here, I won't read this, but the haplotype map is a, is a map that looks at variation in populations. Uh, I also won't spend time here to move, to move towards the end here, but the genome story, I say, gives us the story of humankind in population diversity. And this hat map was uh, a map that helps us to look at what different populations inherit and have to give. And remember, the purpose is for solving problems. It's not for how great I am but for solving problems common to humanity that we work together to solve. And again, this is just showing the movement of time, evolution, humankind moving from the hunter-gatherer age back in the tens of thousands of years, then moving into the agrarian age of farming and settling down and, uh, in the thousands of years, and then moving from there to the industrial age where we are dealing with the uh, hundreds of years, and then to the digital age, which brings us up to where we are now that some refer to, and I like call it the information age. And the genome is a living information and communication system. Our group uh, is grounded in biophysics. And I just include this as my colleague, that's the theoretical physicist who has written mathematical formula to actually give a metric to information structured in patterns of variation. We call this discipline genodynamics, where he, we use first, he uses, then tells me, uh, first principles of thermodynamics and statistical physics to construct mathematical models. It's a mathematical model of information based on entropy or the second law of thermodynamics. He has a model of the genomic energy unit, which is related to looking at how different populations vary in their sequence and how much energy is required for that change. That's going to be very, become very key as we move into the net technology today like, CASP, uh, like the CASPER system uh, where we can edit the genome. We have the technology for how to edit it, but I tell you we do not have the knowledge about how that editing operates in the context of a given environment. So while we can make a change, and we used to make the change looking at what's the, what, does, what we want or what we call the normal, what do the normal have? And then the person that doesn't have the normal, we have the technology to take out what they have that may be associated with the disease and then put in what we think associated, but we have totally not factored in the environment that goes along with that normal. 
And so we need good science, we need research to give us the appreciation that the genome does not operate in a vacuum. It's not just the gene. God made everything and it was good. And the gene was good. And the gene existed before we found it through our technology and called it a disease gene. Before we made this sequence, the asthma gene, the hypertension gene. It was doing something in the context of that genome controlling and regulating biology. But we have a lot to appreciate. So let me hasten on. Um, variation associated with biology and identity. And this statement just points out that when we collect genetic information today, we need to have an appreciation for the role of ancestry, culture, and ethnicity because we have yet to really niche this area of culture, which is based on what we believe and what our attitudes and our thinking. We have not really factored in what that X factor is because we haven't measured with the precision of our thoughts how that impacts the outcomes we want to look at. So I like to say that there is no health equity without genomics because the genome underlies all of biology and you cannot dismiss the power of genomic science in developing models for testing what works in life. That's the point that we're making. And I like this quote, uh, I like to include this quote from uh, Martin Luther King here. The time is always right to do what is right. And we have to have all participants to get at that. So we need to increase the participation of all groups and respect their role in families and as individuals in this era of genomics and culture. So now coming to the end, genomics shifts the paradigm. And I would like to say shift the paradigm from the biochemical to the biophysical, from the molecular to energy level, from the physical to the mental, from the natural to the supernatural, from the body to the soul, from translation, which is lateral, to transformation, which is vertical. And it's no coincidence that that gives you the cross. Translation, how we relate one to another. Vertical, how we relate to God, the maker of the genome and the one who determines what it's all about. Moving from classical Newtonian physics laws and principle to the quantum, which seems counterintuitive, a realm where you can be round and square at the same time, a realm where it doesn't exist until you look at it. All kinds of challenges to our conventional way of thinking, and yet it's mathematically supportable. It's a fascinating time. It is what the knowledge we need to move from disease, death, and dying to third millennial knowledge for health, life, and living. And this is what I'm focusing on now as a science. Got it. Good time. Okay. I am working now on soul genomics. I say, that's appropriate for us as a people. I say, we are the soul people. We brought you soul music. <laughs> we, we brought you soul food. And the genome that has been parted to us with this greater breadth of variation, that's a consequence of our longer time on the globe, which the genome shows the human origins from Africa. And the greatest amount of variation is at the base. All groups of humanity come as subgroups that come out of the base, go to other parts of the globe, adapt, 
in those environments with com comparable changes, but every human population can be related to the African base. And that's science, that's, that science supports that. So I tell my folk when I'm talking to them about you gotta participate in this genome. There are, this is, genomics is not a spectator sport. You cannot sit on the sideline and expect the results to have equal application to the questions that you have. You gotta participate. We are people that cannot afford to make decisions based on fear, based on history of exploitation and manipulation. This knowledge is for all humans, about all of us, and God wants us to know what he has done in this creation called the human being that's made in his image. So our history is one where I can say we may have been stripped down to the spirit, and yet we as a people rise to possess and inherit the promised land of heaven on earth. I will be closing and I'll move to the statement. That's, that's the prize here. We are at a time where we are, the knowledge is coming forth for us to live heaven on earth. But we got to drill down into the knowledge to the truth because the genome operates on truth and it can express anything that's spoken to it, the truth. But to the extent that we speak things that are not true, we foul up the system and we get consequences as well. But I want you to appreciate that Soul Genomics, the book project as I call it, is a third millennial scientific initiative that was birthed on the campus of Howard University as an idea harvested from the science of the National Human Genome Center at Howard. It was founded in 2001, the third millennium. It emerged in the context of the national recognition of the need to increase the diversity and engage the full breadth of the population in biomedical research and, de and the development as an industry. Uh, so the engagement of a, a, a section of the population that had been excluded is now necessary to get the riches of what we all want from our investment in this genome project. It was so designed that way. And oddly enough, and I'm saying this for the first time to this audience, so you can hold me accountable for saying it, but the science and moving forward, I want to tell you, I think the biggest challenge on our soul right now is racism and the consequences of racism, which is an error idea about who we are and the society that we have constructed and when I take the word of God, that God works through everything for his good. There is no situation known to man that God cannot bring a good end out of what he made. And for me, that's true with racism. It makes it so exciting. I want to say, okay, God, show us, show me how you take this history with all of the things we're dealing with. How do you take this history and make it for your glory? And I'm looking to see the Holy Spirit is moving in and through all of us to take the very challenges and problems we're dealing with as a nation. And I say use the truth of his word, of who we are, to actually show it to be for his glory that we might all be. Uh, particulars. This is uh, too small to read here, but um, it's basically saying soul genomics shifts the paradigm of biomedical research and development of genome sequence big data from clinical translation to human transformation. And leads me to my next, my, my last slide, which is the foundation that I initiated in my retirement years, which is called 
Whole Genome Science Foundation. And the vision for this foundation builds on the third millennial scientific initiatives of the Human Genome Project, which was completed in 2003, this haplotype project, which looks at variation in global populations, which was uh, published in 2005, we continue to use, and the brain research through advancing innovative neurotechnologies, which is, the acronym is BRAIN. It's called the BRAIN Initiative, and Obama signed this initiative in 2013. More recent, the precision medicine, which all of medicine is humming with now, how we can use knowledge of the genome to precisely diagnose and target treatment. And this, um, was, that initiative was signed in 2015, and today, that brings us right up to today. Trump appropriated a uh, plan for the appropriation of multiple millions to be invested in what he has called National Artificial Intelligence Research and Development uh, uh, Institutes. And that's his strategic plan. And this is the last slide. In conclusion, I leave you with the genome declares the manifold wisdom of God. The complete sequencing of the whole human genome opens a new era in life science, i.e. biology, offering unprecedented opportunities to investigate the structure, organization, function, and regulation of what I call the kingdom of God within, on earth. And the scripture, actually, I put this here, says in earth. So in earth is in us. <laughs> Christ in us, our hope of glory, heaven on earth. I prayed for it as a child. Many of you did too. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We are part of the glorious genome generation bringing heaven to earth. Through the, right, through the knowledge of and right application of the knowledge for wisdom to solve the problems for his glory. Thank you.